I'm going to start out this review by saying that I spent over $1,000 on my Atomos Ninja Inferno video recorder with a slight reviewer's discount last fall, and I believe it to be the best investment I have made in my production setup. But, like with anything, it isn't perfect. There's some quirks, and I really feel like the ecosystem around it has not matured, and we're going to review it today after almost an entire year of use. Let's jump right in after this. TubeBuddy is the best tool you can get to manage your YouTube channel. You can update videos in bulk, optimize your SEO, syndicate to social media, back up your metadata, and more, all with a simple browser extension. Head to eposvox.com slash TubeBuddy to learn more and download it for free. Full disclosure number one, it is raining in the background, I love it, but it may cause noise in the microphone. Full disclosure number two, as always, I received a slight reviewer's discount on my purchase of, these, of this recorder from Atomos last fall. Atomos is not paying for this review, they have not purchased ads on the channel, and they are not seeing it before it is posted or has any input into what to say or how things are said. If so, they would have probably preferred I made it last year, <laughs> made this review last year. There will also be a recording drive that I mentioned later in the review that was sent on loan for review a few months back and then has since been sent back. But the same rules apply to them as well. Now on to the review. Generally speaking, I believe a video recorder to be a pretty solid investment for anyone's production setup. I actually should have already released a video covering my top 5 reasons that one might want to invest in a video recorder. Check that out if you haven't already. A video field recorder such as this one is a mini computer with a screen that takes your camera's signal and records it to a SSD, but there's much more functionality involved to it. Atomos regularly releases new recorders in their Ninja and Shogun lines with upgraded features and various sizes. The new one that a lot of YouTubers have been talking about and a few have already gotten this year is the 5 inch Ninja V, but feature wise they will be pretty similar. From what I've been able to assess, the difference between the Shogun and Ninja lines primarily include that the Shogun can capture RAW and now ProRes RAW via SCI and has better audio support, whereas the Ninja can't capture RAW and can only capture via HDMI, though there's hints of ProRes RAW support being a possibility somehow in the Ninja V. Not sure how that's supposed to work. The Ninja Inferno is a 7 inch field monitor and video recorder that can capture up to 4K 60fps, be that UHD 4K or full DCI 4K, and it can also capture 1080p up to 120fps. It can record in full 422 10-bit color space if your camera supports it. Support for non-standard resolutions such as 2560x1440 and 2K or 2048 by 1080 is not really there, and you'll either end up with no signal detected or it will adapt to 1080p. It can also capture HDR, wide gamut, and a variety of log formats as well. This features a wonderful 1920 by 1200 IPS screen with Rec. 709 color gamut and 1500 nits HDR capability and 3D LED support. It has a touchscreen to control everything. Around the frame you have rubber bumpers to help it survive drops, vents which get quite warm during use, a quarter inch 20 thread tap for mounting and on both the top and bottom, and a power button, headphone jack, power input, and secure audio connector. The back holds the SSD via their Master Caddy 2 system, just a plastic caddy that you screw the SSD into, and then two Sony NPF style battery slots. I love this as I get to keep using the same ecosystem for batteries as much of my other equipment. That is definitely a plus. It comes with a padded protective case, a power supply, and one Master Caddy for a SSD. I got mine with the accessory kit, which came with two batteries, a charger, another power cable, and a big Pelican style case to keep it all in. A few cables, sun hood, and four more SSD caddies. Sadly, this did not include the HDMI cable, nor an audio breakout cable. I thought this was stupid and bought the official one separate upon realizing this, which was like $100 for some reason, but apparently you can buy generic ones cheaper, or make your own. There isn't much more by way of accessories for these devices, however. There's a cage you can buy, which I may look into at one point, but no one seems to have a proper multi-drive dock or much of anything else. This surprised me, as this is something that's supposed to be used in big production situations. I see them all the time. I'd love a big Ford Bay SSD caddy dock like that that connects via USB 3, USB-C, or Thunderbolt, but that doesn't exist. G-Drive has a two-bay dock that is insanely expensive, but has two bays, but that's it. I might try to have to build my own using a bunch of USB to SSD adapters and a USB hub with some Lego pieces for the frame or something. We'll see. For now, I'm just using a StarTech SATA to USB-C adapter. The screen is great. It's high quality IPS. It's a bit reflective, but has been incredibly useful for monitoring myself as a sh solo shooter. It has all the usual assist features you might expect. Focus assist, zebra ink, LUTs, HDR recreation support, different framing modes, etc. 
You can even hook it up to your computer and use it as a color grading monitor, even for HDR, which is neat since I don't have an HDR monitor. Quality-wise, the recordings are fantastic as well. It supports various ProRes modes out of the box, HQ, 422, and LT, and if you register your Ninja on their website, you can manually activate DNX HR and HD recording in HQX, HQ, SQ, and LB modes. It was a tad inconvenient to have to manually activate it, but I'm guessing they have to pay per license activation, so it was cheaper to eat the costs on the more commonly used ProRes codec, and then save money by only paying for DNX licenses when people really want them. Also, DNX records to a MOV wrapper or container instead of MXF. This isn't a problem for editing, of course, but it might confuse some media players and prevent them from playing the file. In the highest quality modes, video bit rates reach almost 1 gigabit per second, which is a lot of data, but the efficiency of the codecs makes them easier to edit on a timeline than a camera's recorded H.264 codec. But the files are huge. You can save on space by lowering the quality profiles to LT for ProRes or LB for DNX, but I've never really found the need personally. Get you a fast, supported 1TB SSD or higher, and you should be alright. And again, quality is amazing. I have used this both with my camera and my desktop, and the sharpness is just fantastic. Plus, for desktop recordings, it allows me to take my DCI 4K60 signal and zoom in a lot to show tiny UI details without losing any quality. For my Panasonic G7, my current primary main camera, I get an added quality bonus too. The G7 only records to 8-bit 420 color space internally, but outputs 422 10-bit via HDMI. So I actually get to record a more professional, high-quality signal from the sensor, which is great. It also captures HDR, wide gamut, and a variety of log formats. I've used it to capture HDR gameplay for different testing for my PS4 Pro, and it ends up looking fantastic. This is also what Digital Foundry uses for their HDR capture and analyses. Pretty awesome. Something worth noting, however, if the signal coming out of your camera is too underexposed, like a significant amount, you might wind up with digital noise added in the recording with the Atomos that could potentially have been handled a little better via the internal recording of your camera. I encountered this a couple times with my G7, where I was dumb and left it too dark, far too dark. There was much more noise than I'd ever seen from the G7 itself. This suspicion was kind of confirmed when Max Yuryev, I hope I didn't butcher that name too badly, posted a video about ProRes RAW versus S-Log2 from his Sony FS5. When he underexposed to a seriously destructive degree, his internal recording was noisy, but still somewhat usable as a super noisy clip, whereas the copy recorded into his Atomos Shogun had multicolored digital noise from the actual digital gain being applied to the signal. So just keep that in mind. Physically, this thing is built like a tank. I've never personally dropped it on concrete, but I foresee it surviving just fine. And I've seen quite a few older ninjas in the field that were all sorts of cracked and damaged and stuff, and they're still working very hot fine. It does get hot, very hot, and the fan does make a little bit noise. You might be hearing it here since I have it in the path of the microphone, so make sure you don't do this with it, and otherwise it shouldn't be loud enough to contribute to the room noise or get picked up in audio in 99% of cases. It's also very heavy, especially when loaded up with ASSD and both batteries. This caused me quite a bit of trouble trying to figure out how to get the damn thing mounted onto tripods. My videographer buddies kept recommending these little friction arms and swore by the Aperture A9 one, I think it was called. But while the arms themselves stayed together holding up the Ninja, the quarter 20 tap that screwed either into the clamp or into the tripod itself would always spin under the weight and then it'd fall over or get loose. My buddy Technical DIY finally recommended this Impact Super Clamp, a system that works way better and has no problem holding up this much weight. I'll have links to this in the video description. This recorder can support 2 or 8 channel 24-bit audio via HDMI, depending on your camera, or 2 channel balanced XLR input and output from analog as well. This is something that appealed to me initially, as I thought it might be a replacement for my audio recorder as well. However, the poor documentation of its audio features, seemingly no user base using it, and the expensive cables were quick turnoffs. I bought the cable, and then the preamps, though providing phantom power, were not good enough to power my Rode NTG2, which was the shotgun mic I was initially using when I got this. This time, testing out my Rode NTG2 next to my server cabinet and recording directly into the Atomos Ninja Inferno. This is a test. Test, test, one, two, three. What you've been hearing for most of this review has been my Sennheiser MKH416 shotgun mic ran into my Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 audio recorder. I always screw up that naming. Now you're listening to 
the microphone running into the Atomos Ninja Inferno on its own using phantom power and the Fethead Phantom mic activator. I actually have to apply negative audio gain to the microphone. So, especially with the Fethead now, which doesn't really work with my Rode mic that I mentioned, it should be pretty clear and clean, but I've never actually tested it this before, so you'll be hearing this with me, but this may be the setup that I switch to if I can keep it in sync. The audio recording uh, isn't always in sync with your camera feed, and you can offset your camera feed by a, an X number of frames to try to sync it up with the audio, but if your audio's like too early, delaying your video doesn't help. Like I had a lot of trouble getting it to sync up at one point, so we'll see how it goes, but you're hearing it now. Another annoying thing with the audio is that even if you're sending stereo audio to it, it records many different channels, all eight. This results in my scratch camera audio being on the last two tracks of the audio layout. So then to sync it up in Premiere, I have to manually reassign channels and there's a lot of extra steps which you can't really automate. I wish I could customize track order on the device itself because it's really annoying. The rest of the operating system on this recorder supports a lot more features than I could effectively cover or showcase here. There's tools to adjust shot and scene and take order. You can flag shots as good or bad, medium, close or wide, things like that. Most of that involves metadata that's only really native to Final Cut Pro 10, but there is a third party tool somewhere to convert that metadata to Premiere. Not something I mess with at all. You can also get a real-time visualization of how HDR will look from HDR or log sources, how LUTs will look, downsampling, etc. I also wanted to talk about the SSDs. You have to buy your own, of course, and Atomos provides a massive list of drives that they have tested and what they're compatible for. Atomos also has a direct partnership and endorsement with G Drive, which is made by WD or Western Digital, but these are some of the more expensive drives. I originally went with two of the cheapest drives on the compatibility list, a WD Blue 500GB and later a SanDisk Ultra 2 1TB SSD. These are what I used for the first 6-8 to eight months. They're rated for full 4K 60fps recording capability and compatibility, but I had similar issues with both of them. While recording both 4K 30fps and 4K 60fps with these drives, my recordings would randomly get broken up into chunks, and sometimes there would be portions of the recording missing between these two cuts. It's as if the buffer is getting full and can't keep writing for a few seconds and has to dump it to disk, and then once that finishes, it catches up. More often than not, it was just a cut and no missing footage, but there was one time where I had even an entire minute gone. Quite frustrating. I reached out to a couple companies and I got to try out the Angelbird Atomos 4K RAW SSD, a purpose-built SSD that fills the full caddy slot, has a wonderful metal housing, which I believe acts as a heatsink, and even has a cutout to grip when removing it from the Ninja Inferno. This drive had zero such problems and was quite fast to transfer files off of it as well. I was very impressed with the build here. They also let me try out their V90 SD cards too, which performed great. But these drives are still very expensive. I later found a Samsung 850 Pro SATA SSD on eBay for an affordable price and haven't looked back. This thing never had a cutout or drop with my Ninja Inferno ever, to date. So if you're looking for cheaper drives, look for Samsung 850 and 860 Pros. Not Evos, Pros. You can get some cheap on eBay because some people think that they're dead because they have a firmware bug that makes them act funky or just not be detected in Windows upon an unexpected power loss. But an hour of power cycling or less and you have a nearly new working drive and I believe there's even a firmware update to fix that bug once you get up and running. Overall, like I said, investing in the Atomos Ninja Inferno was a great decision for my work. Over the past year, it's been a huge help with video production. It made producing my OBS Masterclass way easier, it makes some desktop captures a lot easier and smoother, and it has been helpful when I do need HDR captures too. It becomes basically the brain of your video cameras and makes you less reliant on specific camera bodies as long as you have clean HDMI feeds out, which my Canon 60 Mark II unfortunately does not. Now that I'm realizing my initial planned upgrade path of going from the G7 to the Panasonic GH5 may not be where I go, part of me wishes I went with the Shogun Inferno instead, which can do RAW via SDI. But I can probably trade up eventually. If you're still not sure if a video recorder like this is for you, check out my video on 5 reasons you should invest in a video recorder, linked in the video description. Down there are affiliate product links to buy the Ninja Inferno for yourself, along with the like button and a subscribe button so you can keep learning about awesome tech. I'm Evil's Vox, and I will see you next time.